it's a great honor not only to be here, but to be alive. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. A lot of young people here. It's very really impressive. They don't tell me what happens to the older people. You ever notice they just keep disappearing? <laughs> and nobody says anything. It's very strange. So my best friends just disappeared. Well, let's get to the transcendence of time in shamanic practice, the uh, subject of this talk. Um, going outside of time is a central aspect of shamanism, and doing it at will, going outside of time. Uh, and it is done, as you know, sometimes by things like the ayahuasca, which is where I got my start in a few decades back. But it's done all over the world generally by sonic driving in uh, most uh, shamanic cultures. And sonic driving can be like the click sticks of the Australian Aborigines. More commonly, it's uh, the drum as used in uh, many Siberian cultures, all of Siberian cultures actually where they have shamans use drum. The thing they don't use in all Siberian cultures is mushrooms for journeying. Uh, most shamans have tried it, but when it comes to journeying, they don't want to be possessed by the spirit of the mushroom. They want to go, just go to get to work. Because the spirit of the mushroom can be so strong that it actually interferes with the shamanic journey. Uh, in Mongolia, they don't know anything about Amanita muscaria, and also in southern Siberia. In northern Siberia, there's more knowledge of it, but it's uh, not uh, typical of the shamanic journey. The drum, drum, drum. So I, I could talk a long time, I'm going to be short, though, because uh, it's a big subject. Uh, there are three types of experiences going outside of time, as I see it. I don't have the final word but I find it useful to group it this way. Uh, these are experiences at will of the shaman, shaman decides. Now, one thing that uh, happens though that uh, shamans don't expect until they've done some shamanism, that's a sort of a trite expression because you can't really be a shaman until you've done some shamanism. We could review that and spend five minutes on it, but this is not a university. Uh, <laughs> When people make shamanic journeys, they do it in most cultures to sonic driving. That is uh, going at a beat of the drumming, which we'll just have a brief demonstration of at the end. Uh, they go through with the help of sonic driving, which is typically in the theta range of EEG waves. And in some cultures it's called the magic drum because it looks very simple but you find it even in southern Chile as being the way the indigenous shamans use it, as well as in uh, the Arctic and uh, many other places. The sonic driving can even be done inside the head with the mouth harp or the musical bow. And when I was with the Shuar in Ecuador starting in 1956, uh, shamans could look like they're doing nothing, but they were hearing the beat inside their heads without disturbing the rest of the household. These were ones who also used ayahuasca. They knew both techniques. Uh, I'd love to talk more about that subject of the uh, mouth harp, but I can't, no time. No time, it's so appropriate here. Uh, <laughs> There are three main types, as I said, of experiences outside of time used by shamans. All are done at will, but the first one I'm going to mention, which is in the group of the type one, the simple experiences, uh, is the compression of time. Like a shaman may look like he or she is gone for half an hour to drumming, but the person may experience having been away for days, weeks, or months. Very common, and they don't expect it. But once they know about that, they can go out 
to where they've been before outside of time and experience things in those long terms. So time outside of time does exist, but it's a different kind of time. And uh, that's for certain kinds of simple journeys. Another type of journey outside of time is to journey into the past. And the shaman, and I'm talking now about Westerners, but the remarks I make apply to Westerners who have done this work with us, as well as indigenous people, I should say that. The other type of experience is, is, is uh, <coughs> very kind, is to go back into time and see experience being in situations such as villages or towns that once existed, usually a few centuries back, usually not more than 500 years or something like that. Could be more than 500, certainly not more than 1,000 years. And this can, however, be studied and extended farther and farther. And you know, have to know the techniques in shamanism how to be going back like that. Going forward is much more difficult, but the I will mention that now. You can go forward in shamanism in the simple type one technique to see your destiny after dying. Your destiny, not somebody else's destiny. But again, you have to know what to do. Your destiny after dying. And uh, this can be involving many journeys over a period of time to learn more and more. This is, of course, characteristic of shamanism. Basically, shamans are not embracing a religion, such as about incarnation or so on. They are embracing techniques. That's why they are shamans. But they can help people find out for themselves what they need to know. And one of those things is, what is my destiny after dying? So those are type one simple uh, experiences. Type two, I call simultaneous experiences. Uh, the most famous type two thing is the dream time, the Australian aboriginals. Uh, it's puzzled many, many people. It's a great topic because Australian aboriginals who are not citified, even some of those know, but the ones that really have gone through the initiations uh, where they really learn important things, which we cannot discuss their their secret. But who have gone through the initiations, those people are simultaneously in the dream time and the ordinary time. And they, they can go back and forth any time, just talking to you or being by themselves. Uh, it's all going on. The dream time, which is the origin of all things, also is still going on simultaneously. It's been a hard concept for Westerners to grasp. But it goes on simultaneously and can be entered at will by the Australian Aboriginal who still is traditional. Much more could be said about the dream time, but this is just a short talk. Type two uh, then involves Simultaneous experiences such as the dream time of the Australian Aboriginals, but it also provides something for all real shamans, and that is being in two realities at the same time, uh, in merging. In merging, which is another name for union, but it's more precise than union, uh, in my opinion. Merging means that the person is combining themselves with another power entity, typically a beneficent ent entity that helps that person uh, heal and do other work. And that is still the person is also partly here in this world. And so choosing to be merged, being in that other reality, timelessness, uh, that reality also, in some people's, is called the only true reality. When I was with the Schwar in Ecuador in the 50s and 60s, uh, they emphasized that the reality, 
that could be trusted was that other reality and that this one was just lies. Uh, there are nicer ways to say it, but that's the way they put it. Uh, and in other cultures, they'll say that's, that's, that's where truth is, not in history. So it's important if one wants to gain shamanic knowledge to uh, discover truth through that technique of merging with the ones who really know who are the deities, not official deities, but ones you find for yourself that will uh, merge with you and you can see through their eyes and be one with them. That's simultaneous uh, type two. Finally, there's type three, which is uh, ecstatic cosmic union. Ecstatic cosmic union may take you a while the first time that you've been there, but once you know it deeply, you can get there at will. This is all with sonic driving. Uh, it's, it's actually amazing. When I first was reading about shamanism, everywhere there are pictures of dr shamans with drums here, drums, drums, and nobody had ever taken seriously the drum, even in anthropology, except as an adornment, as a costume or something like that. So, of course, when I ran out of ayahuasca, this was many, many years ago, when it was legal, by the way, they, everything was legal at the beginning. In the beginning, <laughs> let there be light. Uh, so I experimented finally drumming. And lo and behold, with that experience, it worked. And that's how we built our workshops. Just as my uh, other friends have, have developed things like breath work to get there. There are different ways now to get there. So type three and type two, type three is the cosmic union, the ecstatic cosmic union. Type two is simultaneous. Those two things can be entered easily, rapidly, at will. Even cosmic union. Once you've been there, know how to be there, you can go right there. I mean, I, I could go there in five seconds if I wanted to. Not fully, because I wouldn't want to come back, actually. And that's another thing. The shaman does come back because the experience is not the thing. The knowledge from the experience is the thing. And then the shaman, with the knowledge and power from that, can come back and relieve suffering. So this is the thing that's the safeguard for the shaman. Uh, you can always get there eventually, but why not do some good in the suffering reality before you go there permanently? So what are the purposes of going outside of time? One is simply knowledge, real knowledge. Not belief, but knowledge of these things spiritual. Secondly, going outside of time to get help for healing, shamanic healing, or divination, answering people's questions. Because uh, when you go outside of time, you can bring back these powers temporarily, merged with you, to actually do the work. You can take the credit for it, of course, which I, of course, would never do. <laughs> but no, seriously, uh, if you get your ego involved in this, you haven't gotten the message because it's all out there for us to uh, benefit from, and shamans just are intermediaries. So I want to just re-emphasize that uh, shamanism has this offer, to go outside of time at will. It's easy for type two or type three. Type one, uh, so-called simple, Experiences, it's uh, harder to do it. Well, you you do it, but it takes more time. Now, uh, I'm going to ask Susan McCulkey, who's the executive director of our foundation, to open my bag and uh, pull out a couple things. Open your drum bag. 
we're just going to have a few beats on the drum. It's, to do this work seriously, it takes a lot more. There, there's what I call the shamanic state of consciousness. And uh, shamanic state of consciousness involves learning the methods of the shaman as well as altering your minds. Now, uh, I can tell you, you know, for example, I can tell you right now, I see some questions out there. <laughs> but we're not ready quite for those questions. This is wonderful, by the way. It's comfortable. It's a standby for our people. They, they don't buy it. Uh, we don't make them, but somebody else makes them. But, but uh, if, because the shaman wants to cut out all this extraneous stuff, ordinary reality, which is real, but it's not the reality that we work with. And so we work in darkness, we work with the monotonous feet, and if you could just uh, demonstrate for half, don't expect anything to happen. This is for uninitiated people, this is just drum beating, but uh, just uh, 20 seconds of the beat. she did that longer, I would be off. Yeah. It's really true. Once you get used to us, you can do this work very, very fast. Uh, but right now, I've got to chill down my spine because it brings back things. So, uh, are we, uh, do we have time for a question or two? Yes, yes, sir. All right. <laughs> We have about 10 minutes, yeah. Good. Oh, I was going to hand it to someone else who wanted to. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. Do my job. <laughs> I never had so much help. <laughs> <laughs> Hands and knees, the whole thing. <laughs> wow. Yes, could I ask, please, how Sorry, many. You know, I, I want to see where you. Oh, yeah, stand up. Good, mm -hmm. thank you. How many shamanic cultures? have a belief in rebirth or reincarnation and it's some connection with karma that determines then. You seem to hint at that, but I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more. Uh, okay, two things really, karma and reincarnation. The ones that, first of all, let's leave belief out. You're right, the, the culture as a whole, the society as a whole will have beliefs uh, because they aren't having the first-hand experiences. That is, but the shamans themselves know from their own experience. And those experiences are perfectly tied to their culture and their individual personality. So those things are significant. I would say reincarnation as it is described, let's say for the Indian subcontinent, is not common in most of those cultures. However, uh, It's not that simple. Uh, when a person's been a shaman, there's a good chance that they're going to come back, merged with a new shaman of the same lineage. Uh, if they're Inuit, their very name usually is a name of someone in the family whom they idealize and it is emerging, if their do shamanism, they're emerging with that spirit. So it's, it's, it's not really nice like India, a nice, neat thing. There are many other shamanic cultures where, um, like the Shuar that I lived in Ecuador, that didn't apply for, uh, having to do shamanism. It did apply for some other things that happened in their culture, getting connected with an ancestor, but for getting into shamanism, you just had to pay an existing shaman, buy the spirits, and go home, which may sound very tawdry, but the, you find a lot of shamanic culture that way, particularly uh, in the Amazon. Now, the other part was, uh, besides caste... Karma? Karma, karma, yeah. I would say, without calling it karma, this is very widespread. 
the, the belief, if spiritually uh, you go bad and use your powers to do harm, let's say, as in sorcery, that's an extreme case. The, if you're a properly trained shaman, your powers will not stay with you. They'll get disappointed in you. And they won't punish you, but they'll just leave. And you'll be left holding the bag with probably a lot of enemies out there waiting for you. And usually in that situation in the Amazon where I was, about a year and a half before the person died, they could cause a lot of trouble meanwhile. Uh, so likewise, in Asia, you'll find the shamans wearing uh, brass mirrors. And the idea there is that whatever is being attacked they use brass mirrors for various things, but what, if they're being attacked, it will bounce back, and that will be bad karma, if we use those terms, for the person doing it. So there's definite ethics on this. Uh, Susan uh, has written a nice article on the ethics of shamanism that's in our journal, Shamanism. If you go to our website, uh, you probably can find the article. So I have a question uh, regarding the drum and the temple. You said something, it, you know, it um, affects um, something with brain waves. I just would like to hear more about that. Yeah. Um, in my book, The Way of the Shaman, I talk a little bit about it. Uh, tests were done by a man named Andrew Neer, N-E-H-E-R, his name is in my bibliography, using drumming and seeing how it affected uh, brain waves. I did some work to uh, hooked up to electrodes. Uh, what shamans discovered, without knowing anything about brain waves, they discovered this tempo is really a central tempo. And, uh, when I rediscovered what I, through experimentation, it was not until some years later that I heard it four-minute recording of a Siberian shaman drumming, and I was so gratified because it was the same thing. Well, now I've worked with Siberian shamans, I know. So uh, if you look in the bibliography of that book, and then also my wife Sandra has uh, done work regarding that subject, but not using electrodes herself, but using other th means. Uh, so it's just something that's been discovered. In shamanism, it appears that science lags behind the homemade science of shamanism. Through thousands of years of experimentation, they found what works, and without laboratory coats and so forth. But if you're interested in that subject, uh, Mac, Mo Maxfield uh, wrote, uh, on our board of trustees, wrote her doctoral dissertation on that subject too. So if you want to write into uh, info at shamanism.org, uh, we can give a reference to you of Mo's uh, doctoral dissertation. Does that help? That helps, thank you. Okay. There was a time when there was a, a lot of arguments, not too long ago in anthropology at meetings, they, they couldn't believe the drums really did anything. And uh, uh, it was, finally the case was won, but uh, they thought they were just uh, part of the adornments. And the, and, the, and the sessions of the shamans were performances. It's now it's taken seriously. Something else, or should, are we running out of time? We have time for one question. Okay. Oh, I have a question about uh, the link between uh, the shamanic drums and the state of consciousness it puts you in and the state of consciousness you would be through meditation. Is it similar or do you have an opinion about that? I, well, I I'm opinion. interested in... On, on most everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm happy to, uh, I'm interested to hear it. I'm not always right, of course, but that's a old man's privilege. Um, One more? No, I haven't answered the question yet. <laughs> You know, they haven't gotten over the fact that Rome once owned most of the world, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and
Anyway, uh, just to, to deal with your question to the best of my ability, one time I was hooked up to EG equipment uh, and drumming was done. And the man that did the work, who never published the results, and later, in fact, denied it. Uh, but uh, in uh, six minutes, my brain waves had reached the point that it was taking, he worked with Japanese Zen master, it took them about six hours to get to that state. Wow. So it's cheating. <laughs> and you're not trying to get the same thing. It's not like if you're after no mind, it's not that it's objective. Pretty exciting stuff. But uh, do I have to get one last one? Yes, please. And, <laughs> and the next one is on me. <laughs> you, do you think the Pope would think it's all right to do? Let me call him. Yes, you can have another one. Yes. Okay. He said yes. Oh, thank you. Okay. Do you want to go on the road with me? Uh, Actually, I don't go on the road anymore. What is the next question? You, 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 you tell us. Will you tell us, talk a little more about the difference in objective that you just articulated? Okay. Well, first of all, I'm not qualified. I've never done things like inside meditation, so I'm not qualified to make the comparison. What I always tell people, if you're an expert in that, and then become an expert in shamanism, then you're the person to make the bridge. So I really cannot compare it. Uh, all I know is not not the same objective. Uh, I've had no mind for many years now without, <laughs> without any effort whatsoever. Uh, and I'm looking forward to that final uh, destiny. Uh, I, I think <coughs> the reports are, are quite good if you do things right. Uh, you know, some shamans decide they just had enough, to, they go take the long journey and don't come back. That's, uh, that's retirement. <laughs> Thank you for the questions. I, 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 Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, pleasure.